Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. What was your um, exposure to Bootsy? Oh man, he was such a sweetheart. Yeah, when Mal brought him <laughs> into the fold. Uh, I was out in L.A. at the time. Sure was. Because we were staying at, I can't remember the motel, on Santa Monica Boulevard. And he was just like this real, real super, super quiet, mannerable guy that was the biggest sweetheart you ever want to meet. He's just such a sweetheart. you know. And I haven't seen him in years. I want to see Bootsy so bad. It's been years. God, he's a sweetheart. A real gentle guy that could play his ass off. <laughs> yeah, I just, there's, there's no negatives when it comes to Bootsy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just a great guy. Really a great guy. Could you share with us uh, one or two of the most um, unforgettable experiences you had out there on the road? You know, people have different perceptions of rock groups. You know, rock and roll, rock, whatever you want to refer to it, funk. And by us being a black band, you know, completely, what we had maybe one or two white guys in the group that popped in and out, Larry Fitangelo, you know, on his drums, you know. But um, showing up in different places, I guess I was shocked because I got sick on the road once. I've always had an issue with my health. Most of the time I can play it off. Sometimes I cannot but on this one particular time, I got really, really sick. And we were in Roanoke, Virginia, because I have not been to Virginia since then. I hate the place, and I don't care if it disappears off the map. Excuse me if you live in Virginia, anybody looking or listening to this. But I got so sick that I needed a medical. I needed medical attention. And Dawn, Dawn took such good care of me. Dawn and I, and I think Jeanette, anyway, a couple of the girls got me to a medical facility and I'm trying to explain to the doctor, you know, to tell him that you can call, you know, we're a group, da, 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 da. You know, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I have doctors there, you know, that'll verify that, you know, that I have an issue that flares up from time to time, you know, cause he's looking at us cause you know, we got on them funk clothes and he's looking at us like, Oh, where the hell are they from? They look like a bunch of dopers. And I know they're hunting drugs. They're just trying to get drugs. And I'm telling him, you know, here's my doctor's numbers. You can call them. And I'm trying to be as nice and professional as I can because I think I'm dying again. This guy shot me up with so much drugs that for the next two or three days, I could not function, did not know where I was did not know who I was. And had it not been for Dawn, she was the main player in taking care of me. I could have died out there on the road. He gave me all of those drugs and threw us out of the, out of the facility. And I said, why, why would he do that? You know, and then I, I just had to think he was a hater and he looked at us and he decided that we were just a bunch of dopers. And he's, his thing was, I'll fix her. She won't come around here looking for drugs anymore. He almost killed me. Yeah. There are so many things that can go wrong on the road, you know, and if you don't have anybody that's looking out for you or got your back, then they can go wrong. So, yeah, that was something that was very surprising to me to get sick out there 
and have a doctor damn near kill me. I mm -hmm. really thought I was going to die. Well, that's glad you got through that. <laughs> I didn't expect that story, did you? <laughs> did, did they ever make you uh, collect money? Collect money? Oh, like for, oh, for oh, you mean at the, oh, yeah, you mean go to the box office? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did that several times. Yeah. And you, ever, some, you, ever, you ever get stiffed? Usually one of the guys went with me. No, for the P-Funk shows, no. But when the girls got put off the road, you know, not understanding why, you know, and everybody was upset, you know, here I go again. We ain't got to sit at home. We can go out there and find our own gigs. You know, everybody knows you. You're popular. You're hot. So one of the guys in the band, Parlet Band, had a um an RV. We loaded up the RV and hit the road. You know, I hustled us up a couple of gigs out there, and we got to hmm St. Louis, somewhere in that area of the country where people are a little off as well. They're off everywhere, but yeah, we got there and did the gig and blew them away. And when I went to this guy's trailer, the promoter's trailer, to get their money, and matter of fact, ran into um, damn from the dramatics. Okay, his name will pop up when I least expect it. But at any rate, he had just grabbed his money and he was on his way out. And we stopped to talk. And I said to the guy, I said, I'm road manager and right now managing Parlette because nobody else was. And I came for the money and the guy says, you don't get any money. I said, excuse me. And nobody had ever told me that before, <laughs> especially after working. <laughs> so... I said, what do you mean we don't get any money? You know, so I immediately got upset and turned around and looked at, damn, what's his name? Ron Banks? Yes, because Ron Banks and I were really good friends. You know, and I looked at Ron. I said, Ron, I said, what is up with this guy? I said, would you tell him, you know, who we are and what's happening? Ron looked at me and <clears throat> was I was forsaken. He took his money and he left out of the trailer. I said, you're not going to talk to this guy, try to help me out? And he said, nothing else. So I go back to the guy. I'm like, oh, no, we have no money. We can't leave here without some money. And the guy put a gun to my head. And I'm like, for real, you're going to kill me because you owe us money? And he said, bitch, get out now or you're going to die. I said, are you really serious? He said, are you serious? I mean, I just I just didn't want to let it go. We didn't have any money at that point, you know? And he said, get the fuck out of here. He said, what's wrong with you? So I didn't have any backup. I didn't have anybody to talk a brother down. So I had to leave. And I had to call George. I didn't want to do that. <laughs> but I had to call George. Everybody was gathering in Atlanta for um big music convention. Can't remember his name either. That goes so far back, but he used to have big music conventions every year. And they were all gathering. Jack the Rapper? Is there you go. Jack the Rapper convention. Thank you. I told you, you already have all the answers. <laughs> it was a Jack the Rapper convention, yes. And I had to call George and say, George, we are stranded. Please send us some money so we can get there. So... George sent the money. He was nice. He did not, not leave us stranded out there on the road. He sent the money, and we got to the Jack the Rapper convention, and Parlette turned that shit out. <laughs> I don't know if it was out of frustration. I don't know if it was glad because we were back with the Funk family after the madness that we had just experienced. I don't know what it was, but turned it out. Turned it out. You know, that was the night that uh, Jeanette jumped off the stage and jumped on one of the tables and Harley just turned it out. You know, they just made a name for themselves that night. It was a wild night. It was a wild night. Mm -hmm. So all turned out well on that venture out on the road. Yeah. And we tried to stick close to home after that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was brave like that. You know, come on, we don't have to sit around and do nothing. Come on. Yeah.
Did, did you ever get, um, you know, your hand slapped or whatever reprimanded for, you know, doing anything that was sort of, you know, off, off the grid, so to speak? Oh, no. no, you mean those other men that worked for George, they treated me like shit. So I spent a lot of my time avoiding them, the Archie Ivies and the people like that. Yeah, no, stayed away from them because they did not have my best interests in mind at all. You know, they treated me worse than a groupie sometimes. Never invited to any meetings. You know, I found out second and third hand what was going on. Somebody would tap on my door. I'd open my door. So and so and so and so and so and so. And they walk away. Yeah. So I was kind of on my own. And that suited me fine because to be with them did not put me in a good frame of mind or, or good space. So, you know, and then I would, I would go to George sometimes and say, you know, what the hell's wrong with these guys that work for you? What is their problem? Are they following your orders? You know, and he tried to calm me down. Oh, it's not like that. Oh, yes, it freaking is. But you can't argue with guys, you know, so. Were you the only female on the business side of things? Yep. Yep. Uh, now, in the office, you know, there were girls in the office, L.A. office, Detroit office. But as far as the road goes, yes. The European tour, I took my best friend out there with me because between the two girl groups, they needed two females. So she was a, a, a person of business. You know, um, she was all right with corporate America <laughs> much more than I was. So I said, take a break from your job, you know, and come on out on the road. She had lived in Europe before. She lived in Germany. So she spoke a little German. You know, we were, Frankfurt was one of our stops. So I knew it would be good to have her out there. I'd have some support. I'd have somebody that I could talk to and hang out with, you know, a peer for myself. So that, that trip turned out good, taking her out there. Yeah. But as soon as she got back stateside, she ran from them. <laughs> it was not her cup of tea. But she enjoyed the trip because it was free trip, more or less. Yeah. And she very serious about what she commits to. So I knew that by her going out there, the job would be done and it would be done right. How did the European audiences and business people you had to interact with differ from your American experience? Well, you know, Americans are just so freaking arrogant, you know, so things are just different. People over there are much more polite, nicer, you know, more more giving, you know. In America, it's always tit for tat or, you know, come to my room later or, you know, it's always something. There's always some kind of gimmick. It's always something attached to it, you know. What are you doing here? If I give you this cocaine, will you come with me? No, you can't trick me with drugs. No, you know, I might take your drugs, but I'm not going to go with you, you know, so. People over there were much nicer, much, much more welcoming. Yeah, there was not any real game playing. I'll put it like that. None were played with us. And less less racial issues too? Yes. Yes. That was just not in your face at all. If there was, you didn't even know. That's how cool they were about it. But no. Yeah, much different, much different. You know, America's just got issues, always has. <laughs> Can't, I don't know where the sickness is is bred from. It's the inbreeding in America or something. But yeah, there's just an issue that we have that we're just never going to be able to shake. I don't believe. And what happened when you switched to doing that one tour for the guys? Oh, I had a ball. Had a good time. The fellas respected the shit out of me. I love the musicians for that. You know, they were just they were so cool. You know, and. And I and I would have loved to have stayed out there with the guys, you know, but it was time to check off the road. But no, the guys were wonderful. They supported me. And and because I was so efficient, they started calling me boss. <laughs> you know, hey, boss, what about so and so? Well, no, go ask boss. She'll let you know. You know, it's one of those kind of things. It was just cool. They're still cool. And a couple of them still when they see me. Hey, boss, what's up to this day? You know, so no, the guys were no problem at all. None. The musicians, they were wonderful. What you what know? tour what tour was that? Like 79 or something? Or yeah, 79 and and I went out in 80 as well. I think it was was it 80 tour? Because I remember being in Mile High Stadium in Denver. 
Yeah, so it might have been 80. Yeah. But no, the guys, they were such a pleasure to work with. Such a pleasure. Yeah. No problems so, at all. It was always but, it was always my so-called peers. Those were, like I said, I avoided them. But the original parliaments had left by then. So it was yeah. uh, a lot of the newer, younger guys who were nicer, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were feeling their way around out there still. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I was out there with Grady and Fuzzy and Ray, you know, for, for a minute, you know, and like I said, just awesome. Just really awesome guys. No how, how, how was it working those larger venues? Was that challenging? Uh, Yeah. I got lost once in a venue and they had to come find me. And when I say lost, I wasn't actually lost. I had a tendency when the show was going on to roam. You know, and not just stay in one spot. You know, I'd go out into the arenas and, you know, walk around, hang around, just watch the people and watch their reactions and just watching them get their rocks off on the music. And we were at a venue somewhere and there were no seats on the main floor. It was one of those stand up things. Everybody's standing up. You had to climb up into the, you know, to find seats. And a fight broke out. A crazy, mad mob style fight broke out, you know, where they were breaking glass and just all kind of shit. And nobody could find me because I was out in the middle of all that. <laughs> you know, so and they came. Wait, they did looking. you start it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they were out looking for me. <laughs> you know, finally I pop up. I'm OK. I'm OK. You know, they say, you got to stop doing that. <laughs> you know, so, OK. You know, but. I just wanted, always wanted to be a, around the people and see how they were responding and acting, you know, responding to the shows. You know, they let me know how good it was or how good it wasn't. What What were the stage props on that tour? Do you remember what one that was? Uh, was that the Motor Booty Affair? Was it the Underwater Tour? Or was it the one with like the egg and the... Yeah, because it yeah because the uh, underwater tour. That's when I I let somebody talk me into putting on one of the costumes and almost fell off the stage because I wasn't <laughs> used to wearing all that stuff, you know. Because the underwater tour, yeah, they had all those big costumes and everybody was and the big bird and yeah, yeah, completely covered up. And I think I put on the octopusy costume that night <laughs> i was octopus yeah, and tripped over a monitor and almost went over into the audience and somebody <laughs> grabbed me so i'm like okay see that's how come i'm not trying to be out here on stage it's a good thing osha wasn't around for those costumes okay <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah because they were dangerous <laughs> you know but awesome as they were you know, they could really uh, block your view and block what you're supposed to be doing. The tour that you're talking about, though, I think um, I saw it at the Santa Monica Civic. It was like right around January 1980, something like I that. I remember being there. That sounds, yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. yeah. There are two shows done. You know, because out there, everything's a blur when you're on tour. You know, people have to remind you, people still to this day, remember when you said so and so? And I'm like, hell no. Girl, everybody in the room was pissed off. And I <laughs> know everything's a blur. You know, so some you remember, some you don't. So so when and under what circumstances did you part ways out of that role? Road manager? Mm-hmm. Got sick again. Yep, got sick again and wound up in the hospital. We were on break. And I wound up in the hospital. So the show must go on. So the tour took off and I was in the hospital. And if you do that, you lose your spot. So it wasn't that I left. I was kind of like moved along. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. She's in she's in the hospital. The show has gone on down the road and we'll see her when we see her. But no, I was never asked to come back out. That was in 1980? I was a female with a brain. They were having a problem with that. <laughs> Yeah, was that 80 or 81? Early 81, I probably, yeah. I vacated early 81, the spring of 81, I think it was. Yeah. But then, I mean, it was, well, they still did shows, but the whole, oh, empire, yeah. was, the whole empire was starting to crumble at that point. Oh, yeah, things were getting really shaky. Yeah. Yeah. So did you kind of see that that was starting to happen, uh, or was it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and from time to time, Mike say a word or two about it you know like we got to do better we get got to get this shit right but 
when the when the ball starts rolling and that snowball effect takes over, yeah, there's kind of no pulling it back. From the outside, it was staggering how fast it unraveled. I know. You know? I know. It was so mythic and great. Yes. And uh, unstoppable, it seemed. That's what made it so sad. Yeah, it was a... It was like a train coming at you, man, just to, yeah, and to see it go away and everybody, you know, like, everybody wanted to know why you hung around so long. Hey, the music. Are you listening to the music? What kind of dumbass question is that? <laughs> you know, nobody was making music like that. Yeah. Were, were you there when uh, Lynn didn't show up? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You were at uh, that at that gig. Yeah, she was uh, living with in in partially residing in my home at the time. Yeah, at one point, because when I first met them, I was living in apartments, and then there was a break. I don't know if it was when I went on the road to Tempest or whatever, but then I wound up. I got this four or five bedroom house, and then that's when people started to drift into my house and, you know, I'd look up and it'd be five or six or seven people living there, you know, and, and I'd have to say, look, George, I can't keep feeding them. You have to give me money. I'm saving you hotel money and stuff, you know? Yeah. So it was all, you know, fun and games. It's like one day I would wake up and say, okay, everybody got to get the hell out. You know, I, it, enough's enough. And I would put everybody out. Everybody would go down to the studio with all their shit. <laughs> and George would send somebody by the house with some money. <laughs> I'm like, okay, come on back. <laughs> Did you so, cook for him or you weren't about that? Oh, hell no. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, there were other people that liked uh, cooking much more than I. I've never been a foodie. So, no, that was never my thing. So, no. Yeah, the, the other ladies, they like to cook. They like to hang out in the studio, uh, in the kitchen, you know, and, and do their thing. So, yeah, they did cooking. Now, I made sure my house was clean and stayed intact and stayed together. Yeah. So when uh, Lynn didn't show up that night, I know for Don, it was pretty traumatic. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Did you, uh, were you concerned for Lynn's welfare or did you kind of know she just decided to quit or? At that point in time, Lynn was involved, you know. With Junie, I know. Yeah. And nobody really knew what was on her mind. She was, It wasn't like, you know, she was forthcoming with information or what have you. I knew she was unhappy. You know, everybody knew that she was unhappy, you know. So I don't question people's relationships, put it like that. You know, not unless I think that you are being hurt. You know, so, you know, the things I had to say and do kind of like involved me. But when it came to two of them, her and Junie, that was not my business. Lynn, stay safe. I love you. But you need to make a decision, you know. So, yeah, like I said, she wasn't forthcoming. She wasn't talking a lot then. She was, I told myself, sorting things out herself because things had gotten crazy for everybody. So I'm sure she was trying to make decisions that, in a sense, she may not have wanted to make, meaning leaving the group, you know. So she was torn, I'm sure. But um, Very young still. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We're still talking, yeah, everybody was young. We're still talking kids here. Yeah. We're talking 40 years ago. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I kind of had to kind of stay out of that. You know, that was between her and hers. What What was your impression of Junie? <laughs> as as both of, as a talent and also just a character. A talent beyond, beyond, beyond the realm. Yeah. So freaking talented. Yeah. And uh, Junie being who he was definitely had a problem with with a woman like me, you know, I have the word no in my vocabulary and I have no problems or qualms about using it, you know, on the smallest things or the biggest things I can say no and, and never, ever regret it. Yeah. So Junie had a problem with me. He couldn't shut me up. 
If I had something to say, I said it. You know, as a matter of fact, in one of the tunes he was working on in the studio, he purposely put lines in there just for me to sing. So he, in the background of that song, could say to me, in the music, in the song, shut your garbage mouth, woman. <laughs> so yeah, I gave Junior a run for his money. <laughs> you know, even he stayed at my house for a while. You know, even he was there. You know, and 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 I had to laugh because at one point he went back home to Ohio and brought his car back, which was a Rolls Royce. I ain't give a shit about you putting a Rolls Royce in my driveway. I had a car, <laughs> you know, so it just didn't matter at all, you know. So he just couldn't he couldn't get to me no matter what he tried, <laughs> you know. So it was a little conflict going on between me and Junie. Sometimes it was good natured. Sometimes it wasn't. Yeah. Hmm. What what song what song are you talking about though? I don't have a clue. You don't know. <laughs> you have to understand I was not into being a singer. You know, I was in the studio making studio money. And yeah. I was when I when the music stopped, I was done. <laughs> yeah. I really don't. People and sometimes people say, "Shame on you, Cheryl." I don't know, there's no shame. I either got paid or I didn't. <laughs> you know. You didn't always well, get paid for sessions either. Well, I what are your what are your two or three favorite P Funk songs? I don't know if I have a favorite. I really don't. You know, I'm, I'm I love One Nation. Um I, I don't think I have a favorite. Yeah, I don't. I don't have there's, a favorite. There's not one or two that when you they come on, they're the ones that you kind of really groove with. No, uh because -uh, there's a whole bunch like that. Yeah. No, I don't. I was truly into the music. Yeah. Yeah. One, yeah. One Nation. No, I was into the music. Cosmic Slop. I mean, you know, yeah. Um, I, I was maybe the weird, the P-Funk weirdo. I don't know. But like I said, I would go in the studio, sing, and come out and wait for it to get cut and, and go party. And were, you were in the house for some of the Mothership Landings shows? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was on the road. Yeah. Yep. I was on the road for that. What a religious experience that was. Woo! <laughs> Woo! Made you want to shout to the Lord. <laughs> so you got to, you knew Glenn Goins too then? Ah, oh, yeah. 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 I didn't get to know him very well. But yes, another soul. Yeah, when... When he was bringing that mothership in, there was nothing like it. It was a religious experience for real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he made it swing down. Yeah, God. Every now and then, I still go back to YouTube or something and find Glenn, so I uh, can just so I can gives just you, hear. gives you chills, goosebumps, all that. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, brings tears to your eyes. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, Glenn. So, uh, Cheryl, so after that, you ended up going to some movie work you had mentioned. And what, where did your life take you after that? Um, I, um, I worked for Janet Lee. Uh, you remember, you remember Janet Lee stabbed in the shower, psycho. Oh, what's, J what, J what's, Jennifer, J uh, Jennifer. What's her, what's her, no, what's her name's mama? Janet Lee. Yeah, Janet Jenny? Lee. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What's yeah. her name's mama? What's the girl name from, you know, the Michaels movies? I used to take her to school. Oh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Jamie Lee. Yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I used to drive her to school sometimes. Yeah. Because <laughs> I worked in the home. Yeah, I was kind of like the person that took care of all the booking, the books and the banking and, you know. And, How did you meet her or get in that? Uh was bored and went to an employment agency one day <laughs> and the person that 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 took me you know different people take you and talk to you and the person that said miss james would you come this way was a white woman from detroit and by the time we got through laughing and talking i was hired 
She called Janet and said, I'm sending somebody up to your house right now. You're going to love her. <laughs> it's my energy that gets people. <laughs> <laughs> so I went up to the house, sat and talked with Janet. I couldn't stand her. We were both cancers. Yeah. And I worked up there for a while, you know, ran into all kinds of people, worked on some of her projects. They used to do this big thing every year, you know, so her and Lucy played tennis together every morning. Lucy would come in with that cigarette dangling off her lip. Morning, Cheryl. How you doing today, girl? Because <laughs> she had that real heavy, raspy voice. <laughs> I'd say, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, and who else did I see cut up at Janet's house? George C. Scott. Remember that actor? He was a little oh, yeah. off. in anyway. Patton. Yes. Yeah, Patton. Yeah, I listened to him curse everybody out at a dinner thing one night. They had a big dinner thing. Of course, I had to eat in the kitchen on those nights. You know, I had to eat in the kitchen with the maid, you know, and, and other help in the house. Mm. So I heard, I listened to him curse the, the whole party out that night at the dinner table. Beverly said, Hills, did you say that already, or where was it? Truesdale Estates. Yeah. Okay. Yep, Truesdale Estates. I shall not give the address. I don't know who lives there now. <laughs> uh, Sammy Davis Jr., I met him. And the first thing I said was, oh, I'm taller than you. <laughs> He looked at me like, where the hell she come from? <laughs> you know, but I was just making it funny. You know, so there was this big uh, charity thing that they did every year. So they let me work on that. That's how I met a lot of those people. Yeah. So it was an okay gig. Yeah. Since I've never really, really been impressed with people and their station in life. It's always made it easy for me to walk away or or not bow down to you because you go to the bathroom just like everybody else. Did, did you keep track of uh, what was happening with George Clinton and that camp? Uh, nope. Nope. Mm -mm. Whatever I'm committed to, that's what I'm doing. I've kind of sort of been that way. Yeah. But maybe you would hear like an atomic dog or something on the radio and think, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. And dance. Yep. Get up and dance. <laughs> yeah. I used to dance on the way to work in the morning. Get up, smoke a joint, dance real hard, and go to work. <laughs> that sounds like a good gig. That was morning ritual. <laughs> How'd you like living in uh, that part of the country? It was cool. You know, uh, I had to get the boredoms off me because if you're some from a place like Michigan, Michigan is a beautiful, beautiful state and you get all of the seasons of the year. That's why I love Michigan. So when I first went to California, after a couple of years, it's like, oh, this is just too freaking boring, all this sun and nothing to do. So I lived in the valley. I lived in Van Nuys. I started off in Van Nuys, and then I went to Santa Monica, and then I went to Beverly Hills. So I, I had wait, wait. I went to grade school in Van Nuys, and what, I went what? I went to a middle school and junior high in Santa Monica. Wow. Okay. Yep. I lived at fifty five eleven Fulton Avenue in Van Nuys. So in the in the winter, when I got really bored, we would jump in in a vehicle and drive up to the San Gabriel Mountains. And have the wildest snowball fights ever. Mm. And then come back down and take our clothes off and walk barefoot. So that's how I got through those first few years. And, and then it was just like hanging out and no big deal. But then I did get bored and I just didn't want to do it anymore. I had to come back to the to the fall and the winter because I love winter. I grew up ice skating outdoors and skiing and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, it's one thing I've really appreciated moving from LA to I'm in North Carolina now. Okay. Actually having a sense of some seasons. Yes, know? yes. Yeah. People out there don't know that there's other things happening, you know, in the universe <laughs> when it comes to the weather. Yeah, so now, nah. yeah. Got to have my changes. So I like to ask, you know, those that have brushed with it like you have, um, what, what is funk? You know, someone says funk music or funk. What does it mean to you? What does it conjure up in your mind? 
something that gets down in my bones and I just, you, you can't sit still. You cannot, you know, to think that you can listen to some funk and just sit and listen, that's not happening. It, it gets into you, you know, it's like your body absorbs it and it starts to live inside you. You know, it's just like this thing starts to grow and to live and to survive. And and like I said, it's just just nothing like it. Now, there's no other music that gives me the feeling that it does. It's like you happy and it makes you feel happy. It makes you feel nasty. It makes you, yeah, just, just your emotions run the gamut. If you really are listening to the music, it gives you everything. It gives it all up and you give it all up. I have danced so hard listening to the funk. And so I think I'm just going to black out, but it's about that music. Something about the music, <laughs> something about the music. <laughs> How do you reconcile in your mind uh, people that don't seem to get it? They just walk into some other kind of beat. <laughs> you know, they just not, yeah, just they just not programmed to absorb the font properly. <laughs> they just, yeah, I, I I don't know what to say to them. There's something missing in their soul if you can't get into that. Something's missing deep down. Yeah, because it's so basic and so primal and so, yes, yes, you know, yes. how can you not? Right. Yes. So. How can you not? Yeah. Hmm. And I don't care where you are. <laughs> if it comes on, you got to move. You got to let somebody know because somebody want to ask, what are you listening to? The funk? Yeah. Are, are you surprised that George is still at it? Yeah, no. I mean, who, th who thought he would survive this long? For one thing, with that well, lifestyle. yeah, nobody thought he <laughs> was going to pull through all of that. <laughs> but hey, Funk is alive, yeah, and he found his way in, back out, and now he's back again. So, and I think even when he finally stops, it's going to probably still go. It will, yes, it will. Mm hmm. He is truly leaving a legacy behind. Yeah, that music will live on. The aliens will be playing that music. <laughs> Back then when you were part of it, though, did you ever think about something like that? Did you ever imagine that decades later it would still be important? Absolutely not. Nope. I knew I would still love it, but I didn't think that the rest of the world would... Every time you turn around, you would hear a lick here, a lick there, a phrase there. The rappers are rapping here. They're doing their thing there. I mean, hey, no, would never have imagined that people would be grabbing for that music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He changed. He changed music. A lot of rap wouldn't be rap without George. For good and bad, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He changed it. Yeah. He changed the world of music. How how big do you think the girls might have gotten if they had had everything behind them? They'd still be out there, too. They'd still be out there because they'd still be giving up something different. There were no... The only female group that you could even come close to, even comparing them to, would have been... Patty LaBelle and the Bluebell. Other than that, no. It would have been them killing because they were funky. They gave it up. You know, they, they crossed lines that women weren't crossing, and it worked. You know, sometimes I would find an outfit and say, wear that. Oh, no. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it would kill. So, yeah, they'd still be there. Yeah. Were you surprised when um, they were left out of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Mm-hmm. 
Everybody is. Yeah. Got a raw deal on that. Yeah. But kind of seems like it goes back to some of the things you were talking about uh -huh. that you had to endure back decades ago. The life of women. Yeah. The life of women out there. Yep. Yep. Back to that. Mm -hmm. Just couldn't get it. They just women. And why? <laughs> why? What is it with you guys? <laughs> well, so, but how do you feel then today when you see someone as powerful as like a Beyonce or, um, you know, some of the women today, a lot of the top artists today, probably most of them today are, are, are female, actually. Yeah, they're good. I'm happy for them. I love their little music thing that they're doing, but they can't cut it. They're entertainers, strictly entertainers. You know, the whole glammed up and you know they're really doing that serious entertainment thing they're not giving up their souls to the music they're not giving up that raw to the music these women were raw and they were putting it out there and nobody's raw and putting it out there like that well whether you like however you feel about them i think of some like maybe a megan the stallion and um Cardi B, these women, I mean, they're multi millionaire, billionaires. Oh, whatever, absolutely. You know? And but they're we, kind of doing whatever the hell they want, it seems. But we're talking about a, a, a different genre, though, too. You know, they're they're working, they're coming out of that rap thing and, you know, that, that, that whole other lifestyle thing. Their music is more lifestyle music that they're, that they're doing, as opposed to just giving up raw funk music. You know, they're, 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 catering to to their money and their in their jewelry and their men and the drugs and uh, you know they're even beefing in their music you know as you know i've got them separated from these other women like i said that are just stomped down raw <laughs> it's something about that raw that just makes them stand out yeah i guess closer to that well i think of some of the blues women you know from the past too some of those Women that did blues, they get pretty down. Oh, or... no, they were just downright nasty. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them were really nasty. <laughs> yes. You know, so that, that that's where I've got them. I've got them in their in their in their in their thing for real. Yeah. Yeah, no, Beyonce and all those women, yeah. I'm glad to see them stacking the money the way they are. You know, it's it's just awesome because it's way overdue. Yeah way overdue but my girls mm -mm, raw yeah but hopefully they help break some of those barriers that today you know have helped enable yeah some of the women of today to, to have fewer uh constraints you know creatively exactly out yeah there and, and especially on the business side too there you go that's where thank you thank you that's where i want it to be when i was young yeah I wanted to be one of those powerful women making other women be able to do their thing without all the bullshit. Mm -hmm. Never made it. Yeah. <laughs> well, but you know, you certainly uh, played a key role. So when you look back, what are you most proud of accomplishing in your uh, career with that? Sometimes I don't feel like I did really accomplish anything because the fight was just so great. But I proved to myself that I can take a group of people and allow them to be able to do what they're experts at, allow them to have that space, that room, and, and move them from point A to point B to keep them safe, to keep them moving forward with their talents. You know, and, and be respected while I was doing it. That was important to me because I was a woman out there and because I know how women were looked at and treated. So it was important for me to do what I did and do it right and and, and to maintain that respect. And, and that I did. I do believe that. Yeah, like I said, when I see the guys today, they still treat me with that warmth and that love that they did when when I was working for them. Because I was working for them, you know? Yeah. 
I looked out for them as best I could, and they knew that. Yeah. So occasionally you might have contact with like a Lige or a Mike Hampton or a, or who are when, we talking about? When they come through town, I see them when they come here. Yeah, if they're doing a gig that's uncomplicated, if I'm going to have a problem getting in somewhere or it's just a hassle at that particular venue, then no, I'm not going to see them. But if it's a place where I know the people are friendly and it's not going to be, you know, a whole big to do. You know, like, hey, here's an old groupie trying to sneak in. <laughs> you know, I'm not into that, you know. But if I can see them someplace where, where, like I said, where it's cool, then, yeah, a lot of hugs, a lot of kissing going around. Yeah. Picture taken. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. nice. That's always good. good. Always good to see them. Always. That's good to hear. Because, you know, I've always heard, you know, once you're like part of the funk mob, I mean, you're always part of that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yep, Boogie's old lady is in town right now. I got to see her before she leaves. Yeah. Yep, I, we saw each other earlier this year. She came to one of our shows, and I haven't seen her since. So I want to see her before she leaves town because I love me some little Boogie. <laughs> I like to Boogie. Everybody love Boogie. Oh, I know her from Facebook. Um, yeah, Donna. Yeah. Donna, you don't need. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's yeah, in yeah. Detroit right now. Okay. Yeah. yeah, she's nice. I mean, I haven't met her, but very nice. I she's a sweetheart. Tell. She's yeah. a sweetheart. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Outstanding. Is there anything else you want to share or get out there uh, before we wrap this up? No, I guess, you know what? I'm just surprised that you wanted to interview me. I'm still, I'm just like, why? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm glad we did. I'm glad I'm meeting you face to face, sort of, kind of, and and no, and 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 thank you for for letting me share, you know. And I can't wait for the book to come out. Everybody that's listening or watching or whatever they're doing, get the book. Mothership Connected is going to answer all your questions. It really, really will. Yeah, we can't wait. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cheryl, and uh, take good care of yourself. Have a great 2024. Yes, and, my um, dear. Yes. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkandstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkandstuff.net, and linking through funkinstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven results-oriented professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on keep vibing on to the rhythm of the one. We'll